Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Welcome to Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction podcast, the podcast by emerging writers for emerging writers, because sometimes we feel like pros and sometimes we feel like cons. I am Patty Boylan. I am hosting for today and joining me are my esteemed colleagues, Alex Eldridge. Hey, uh, my name's Alex. I am a writer. I have put out a collection of short stories, um, as well as publishing in a few magazines and things, the most recent of which was the big issue, mm-hmm. uh, fiction issue edition. So, yeah. Which was a big deal, a big deal and the big issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> and Phoenix Rig. Hello. I too am a writer. That's why I'm here. I'm the founder of Bent Light Writing, home to a number of editing services that I employ internationally. And um as well as uh I've I've have done some work with an agent, and that's been a wonderful experience. You are an agented children's book author. It's true. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Mm-hmm. And I am a creative writing teacher, editor, bid writer, and sometimes fiction editor. And altogether, we are three-sixths of Precipice Fiction. Matan, uh, Ali, and James can't make it this week. They're off having adventures. So, gentlemen, the topic for today is show, don't tell, which, I mean, I was going to ask you if you guys have heard of it, but I, I, I think there's a good chance that you and most people listening to this will have heard of the aphorism show, don't tell. It's so often said and bandied about as one of the biggest truisms in writing. But is it necessarily true? Do we always want to show and not tell? Are there times when telling is actually a good idea? And what are the nuances of show, don't tell? How can we make it work for us in our own writing? I'm looking forward to getting into this topic. It's it's something yeah, that- I love this one. It's, yeah. It's a I juicy mean, one. You're a editor, Phoenix, and no doubt you will have written stuff about showing, not telling so many times in the line notes on given edits. Mm-hmm. It's big. It's very it's true. Big. It's, it's around. So before we get into that, um, why don't you guys tell me a little bit about what you've been reading since the last time we talked? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I've been going through, uh, what have I been reading? Feel, feels like an existential one this morning. It's like, what, what am I reading what, these days? What have I been? Well, look, I, I am a, I can say this. I am a judge for one of the, uh, the categories of, um, or the Aurealis awards. I can't really? say which one. Obviously. Are you really? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, right. it's um, enormous. It's like, Honestly, they take anyone. Like it's just a form. Um, <laughs> Don't I, say I am doing that. that so I'm no, going, that's you. I'm, you are. You know, you've got the, you've got published works now. You've got two. You're out there. You've been paid for yeah, your work. Yeah. Remember that's, the literati. That's true. I suppose so. I, yeah, I, suppose, yeah, I mean, they did ask me what I'd done and what my uh, you know reference to writing was. So I suppose that that took. You Absolutely. know, they, they could have rejected me. This is a uh, pro yeah, I'm going through that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through a, a couple of awards. Uh, a couple of books from that. Um, like I said, I don't want to say what the, what the specific genre I'm judging mm-hmm. is because that's the conflict of interest. But um, yeah, I'm going through that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different different works there, a lot of different skill levels in that. Um, and I'm sort of working my way through that. Some things are better than others. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've just been working my way through a couple of those books. There's all, it's, it's books. I am reviewing books and there's a lot of them. There's a lot to get through. It feels like homework. It feels like I'm back in uni again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's what I've been reading. Entire books. Entire books. Like lots wow. of them. Like 10 of them. Wow. I is mean, you, a, you have a fair time to read it. Is that a paid gig? No. Okay. No. It's a kudos gig. I feel like I feel like I might have uh it might have been the one that they just shunt off to all the first timers. <laughs> like the one that I pick picked specifically, because it is very there's there's a lot of books. Um Am I going to finish them all? Are it's- you going to go slowly <laughs> mad? Maybe. But it's going to look great on the resume. Well, so um, that's what it's all about, right? I guess. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. And, you know, there's networking, I suppose, to some extent. So that's cool. Mm. Okay. Alex reading a massive pile of books of varying and questionable quality. Phoenix, what have you been up to reading, watching, yeah. playing? The last week and a half or so, I edited. So one thing I've been recently doing is... Bent Light Writing has been partnering with small publishing houses in Australia. So I started mm-hmm. editing for some of them and 
so I, for the last week and a half, I was proofreading slash copy editing um, this one book. And it was just very good. I can't say anything about it, but like, um, yeah, it was like a hundred, hundred K word novel that I shotgunned in a week and a half. And it was like, it was a very good book. And that's one thing I'm really enjoying about working for publishing houses now is because the quality of work that I'm sent is so much it, it, there's kind of like yeah. a bar of entry yeah so seeing as it's already gone through a filter uh it's like oh wow pretty beefy piece of literature that i got to read which is beautiful and then i've been yeah i've been plowing through um a D D let's play through dimension 20 uh, called never after and it's slowing down a little bit in the middle but i still love it the beginning was fire i was so into it and let's play as like an audio podcast where people play an engaging game of Dungeons and Dragons and dramatize it for you, right? Mm-hmm. And then this one comes with video as well, and the video is uh, okay. pretty cool too. Their their okay. production value is actually very high. Okay, very cool. What was that called again? Uh, Never after, and it's done by Dimension Twenty. Never after. Check that out if you're interested in watching some entertaining nerds play Dungeons and Dragons. It's- Especially if you like um kind of spooky, grim fairy tale type flavor. That's nice what this one is about or working with very cool very cool uh i myself i've uh i've just finished a short story by um gosh now what's his name he did rendezvous with rama arthur c clark it's called oh yeah the nine Uh, billion names of god which wow yeah i picked that up because like the name itself is just fire that's a Um, title yeah and the ending to this is particularly good i'm not going to give away what happens but the premise is in the 60s a Tibetan monastery hires a computer engineer. That's all I'm gonna say. It's okay. um, it's good. It's it's good. It's got a really weird take on on theology. Show don't tell. During a TED talk, the head of Pixar, Andrew Stanton, once said the following: "Make the audience put things together. Don't give them four. Give them two plus two. Now, what did he mean by this? Well, let's say we have a scene of a dirty-looking child." You know, and they're staring through a window with longing in their eyes. And beyond the glass is a family sitting down to a large and delicious looking meal. Now, we're not told that the child is an orphan, that they're very hungry, or that they wish they had a family. Instead, we're given clues, imagery, moments, expressions, and invited to construct the truth for ourselves. Readers or, or watchers or players of games, humans in general, we love the process of putting things together. You know, it's it's often said that we're meaning finding machines and we're hungry to decode the world. And the difference often between a really good book or TV show or whatever, and one that's eh, maybe kind of doing it by the numbers, is one that paints a scene and kind of invites you into it and invites you to make sense of it versus something that's really kind of on the nose and maybe a little over obvious. I'm sure as I'm saying this, you guys are thinking of examples of both that you've seen. Texts that do it really well and texts that do it a little ham-fistedly. But today we're going to examine that concept, which is show, don't tell. Something that's often talked about, often misunderstood. And once you've got a handle of it, a, a really powerful concept in writing. I mean, I'm assuming both of you guys have a have a pretty strong handle of the concept of show, don't tell. But you might have some different ideas about it. Um Alex, what what comes to mind for you when you hear that phrase? Um, The thing that comes to mind for me immediately when I think of that, anytime I think of that, uh, is don't bore the audience. Don't bore the audience. It's like, like, okay, so the reason why I love and and glom on to the the concept of show, don't tell, maybe even to my detriment um, as as I get further on into my um, writing career, is that it's, it's a concept of that is synonymous with concision. The idea is you want to pare things down um, in such a way that, like you said, the audience can put these things together. So like, it's a lot more efficient for me to even write that scene. Like they say a picture paints a thousand words, but I don't think that's true. It's a lot more efficient for you to write that small scene, especially if you're good at writing quite concisely. And I, I think I've got a skill in that. Um, than it is to explain the orphan's backstory, to explain how he got there, like to to, to write all these things out. Um, so f- yeah, one thing I think it's it's concise. I think that's one one very uh, potent element of it. Uh, also, show don't tell is inherently action. Um, so show don't tell I think just says pro- provide provide me with action, provide me yeah. with something happening. It doesn't matter if that's 
a, you know, like a, uh, a, a highway chase or, um, you know, like uh, someone ch- running after someone or, or a, a gunfight or even just two people talking, uh, yeah. it is inherently action and that inherently moves the plot forward. That's yeah. that's kind of the two main takes on Show, Don't Tell, I would sort of have. So I'm actually doing this off the back of teaching a class with it. I, I teach creative writing to kids and I've got some very talented writers in my class, but one thing that they often do is rather than have like a dialogue scene happen, they'll just tell you that the characters had this conversation. So I find myself mm, often saying uh, yeah. like, well, why don't you instead show us the conversation, give us the actual dialogue, even if you only give us like a little bit of it. And immediately they're like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. That'd be so much more engaging. It's so when you say action, I mean, obviously action is something broader than like action scenes. It's just things happening in the present mm-hmm. moment on the page, right? Mm. Phoenix, what about you? I mean, obviously you've encountered this a million times in in editing. Mm-hmm. For me, it's, it's like, um, it's more like engaging the senses as opposed to engaging the brain. And obviously when pe- readers are reading, their brain's always engaged, but it's the idea of, to me, it makes the literature more engaging and puts the reader more in the place as opposed to them feeling like they're being told a story. They're more so feeling like they're experiencing the moment a bit more. And one one example that I had of this, I had one client who was writing a scene where uh, their main character and a side character were walking through like um, a courtyard of a castle or something like this. And they were just saying the the castle was, the environment was scary. It was creepy. Mm. And I was just like, well, rather than tell me it's creepy, this can be an opportunity to, it's an invitation to play with the space a bit more. Rather than tell me it's creepy, tell your reader it's creepy, show them the environment and let the reader decide it's creepy. Like describe elements of the environment, like is the light bending at queer angles? Is the is there an odd hollow dripping sound, whatever it is that creates this sensation of creepy and let the reader feel the creepiness as opposed to just telling them it's creepy. It can also be an opportunity to give some subtle, show some subtle character building by describing the scene through a character's lens. You can show some ob- some element of subjectivity, what they're finding creepy about the scene and build sort of a sense of like what they find creepy, what's putting your characters off a bit in that moment and there's it's a it's a really big opportunity as opposed to just kind of giving giving adjectives you want your reader to sort of slap onto the scene yeah it almost sounds like providing examples in the scene like, but you, mm. you back things up you back up the information with well with these sensations and examples and things that are happening in the moment but what's interesting mm. is and I think this is why like, I, I didn't actually understand this concept for a long time. People would say it and I'd smile and nod, but not really Same. have a handle of it. Because both of you guys, I think, are totally right in your definitions. But Alex, you were talking about it as um, taking things out and knowing what to subtract. Whereas Phoenix, your examples are all about adding more in. It's actually it additional. Richer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And both are true. So I'm hoping that as we talk about this, we can start to drill down into why both the things are true and sort of like the the real purpose for what this does um, behind that. So just, just for a little bit of background, the, the concept of show, don't tell is credited to the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov of Chekhov's gun fame. You guys have heard of Chekhov's mm-hmm. gun, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the idea of in the yeah. first act there's a gun on the mantelpiece by the end of the play the gun needs to go off it's about being economical with details um he said don't tell me the moon is shining show me the glint of light on broken glass what do you guys mm, think of that quote don't tell me the moon is shining show me the glint of light on broken glass well what he's done in that quote brilliantly is uh sort of what i was my version of of uh, of of the concision there, and as you said, um, these are not mutually exclusive concepts. This is just the one that I tend to focus on because I just everything I do, I try and narrow down to like the, the finest possible point I can. But that's not to say that that you can't take it the other way. Um, so he says, "Don't show." What was it? You don't show me that. Can you don't tell me the moon is shining? Show me the glint on broken glass. Show me the glint of light okay. on broken so- glass. So in that quote, the second half of that sentence is just so much more engaging because mm. to my point in concision, 
it is it's not actually a shorter sentence than the don't tell me the moon is shining like objectively there is more material there but the extra detail and flavor it provides in there like sh- tell me the it just it sounds nice for a start yep. but also the implication that there is broken glass tells us that something has happened yeah it yeah. O- sets up an open loop uh it, it it implies that there has been conflict and it it basically creates this sense of mystery so that that quote is actually doing a lot which mm. I think is kind of the point he's trying to make. I, I think um, it is. He, in, yeah. By showing, by creating these little things that you can experience, like sensually, in, turn, in this this case, like we can kind of see the broken glass uh, that's reflected, reflecting off the moonlight. In showing us those details, you imply a lot of other things, like who broke the glass? Um, you know, was it broken recently? Did this happen at, no, you know, like there's, there's a lot of things that, that can be drawn out of that. Yeah. Um, and you could, you could add further to that. You could say the, the glint of blood on the broken glass. Oh, well, now we know someone's been physically injured, you know, that, and, and that's only another two words. So that's what I was kind of meaning by uh, concision there. I'm sorry if I'm harping mm-hmm. on that concept, but it's just. Quite no, it's, it's a good, it, it's a good concept. Yeah. And importantly, when you say show me the glint of light on broken glass he's not saying the moon was shining and the light was glinting on the broken glass so there mm. is information being taken up there you're never actually told that the moon is shining at all you're only seeing yeah, the implied. effects of the moon on the world which is like a more interesting and engaging thing um so mm-hmm. next, i think i think to your point as well sorry patty i think to no. your point as well uh the thing you said initially um, about having the audience put things together um yeah. that's part of it as well it is in it is in um excising details that the audience is able to put things together so not only is it more efficient it actually brings the audience more into it um one one thing that beginner beginning writers learn very quickly is that if you provide too much detail, if you if you're doing a car chase and you describe exactly how the cars run into each other, that's a lot of that's a lot of information for a, a brain to mentally construct, mm-hmm. right? And if you don't describe it just so, and actually, even if you do describe it just so, um, it is physically fatiguing to work that out. So not only is there a lot of work, you actually also take agency away from the reader being able to um, construct this in their own mind in, in whatever kind of, like, I didn't tell you exactly how the glasses, you know, um, smashed or broken over each other. You have to think of that image yourself. So you're, yeah. you're giving the reader a sense of agency to create that mm-hmm. image themselves. Yeah. I, have you guys seen, because the, the, the original quote, and I'll give it again, because it is really good. Um, make it's the audience very put good. things it's together. Very good quote. Don't give them four, give them two plus two. So that's by the the head um, writer. It's just as the head of Pixar, the head of Pixar. Have you guys seen the film Up? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful film. And it's got that beautiful, heartbreaking extended scene at the beginning that goes for like, what, five, 10 minutes of like this whole Mm -hmm. guy's life. There's no dialogue at all. They're literally just like showing you scene by scene what happens and not even in an overt way. Like spoiler, when we know that the guy's wife dies, they don't even show her dying. I think they just show her absence. So Mm. that's, yeah. yeah, Like the armchair, isn't there an empty armchair or something? Something like that. It's been a minute. I don't even know. They might have a grave or he's either standing by a grave or he's standing alone on a hill. Both of remember. those things yeah. sound right, but I think I might be confabulating. The point <laughs> is, there's just She's, but it is absence. Yeah, these wonderful like little suggestions of what's going on, and it's enough to go, oh no, oh no, she died, mm-hmm. rather than mm-hmm. telling He's you that, dead. that she died. So Phoenix, yeah. um, back to, don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the lit glint of light on broken glass. What what came to mind when you you heard that? Well, for me, like. I don't know. I guess I might, I don't even, I wouldn't describe myself as tactile, but I might describe myself as textural, especially when it Ooh. comes to writing. Okay. I love, I love creating senses of texture and even in places where it doesn't necessarily make sense, like in combat, I might give something that actually can't exist in the real world, but it paints the moment. Um, I remember you describing your work as like, yeah, it's synesthetic at some point, which yeah. is, is true. And it's a really nice little touch. Yeah. So glint of moonlight on broken glass for me it just it gives me it gives me a texture broken glass and it just like pulls in so many more so much more of my senses as well as it is like it like alex was saying i'll just build off of that it's like it's such a an amazing lead-in to start to start a sentence with the moon was shining 
then in your next sentence, you need to then provide a hook for what's going to happen. Whereas if you start with this, the light reflected off broken glass, you already have your run in to immediately flow into what you're going to say next. It's kind of like Deadpool, where you start on the cigarette lighter flying through the air and then you do your zoom out of what's going on in this scene. Mm. It's a very good moment to moonlight bro- on broken glass and you're you already give your you have your seed for how you build the scene around it and that it is very succinct yeah very succinct there's um of course like a real difference in the approach to showing and telling and, and we've been saying during this whole thing that that uh telling is wrong showing is right but i'd like to take a sort of a step back and look at what both are for telling is factual Hot take what hot take i said hot hot take this is a Showing... warm this is a warm take it's a warm take this is yeah, a take a that i think take. everyone can get behind but you know it might yeah be a little, it's true a little titillating uh telling is factual telling telling gets the point across quickly and directly if you're writing say a technical manual you want to tell them you might give an example but that's as a secondary thing to straight up telling it's a little less rich a little less poetic but what it does is get the point across quickly showing tends to be more emotional uh it, it engages us it, it causes and invites us to imagine a scenario obviously when a reader's emotions are engaged they start to imagine details they become more drawn into the story they care about characters more they start to think things more vividly but i think there are times when you want to tell what do you guys think of that idea are there times in your writing where you just straight up tell the reader without having to go through the ring roll of talking about the light glinting off the broken glass one one person that has done this really well and got me to appreciate the art of telling like it helped me a lot actually was um scott lynch in the lies of Locke lamora okay i've heard you guys talking about this a lot yeah uh so it's an audiobook i listened to and it was very like he he does an excellent job of like it's like a it can be used as a pacing tool as well as like yeah well, what do you mean as a pacing um, tool? Like, because that's an interesting yeah. point, right? There. Yeah. So, like, in your ebb and your flow of your book, as you're zooming in on scenes and zooming out, sort of thing, um, you'll have these moments of really dense, more actiony scenes where you're kind of playing play by play, clip by clip, feeling by feeling, and you're right there in the reader, in the character's skin, experiencing the moment. And then there's moments where you'll zoom out, you'll back away from maybe everyone, and kind of focus on the world as a whole or the the city as a whole or whatever and you might give a bit of history a bit of information that sort of enrich enlivens Mm. kind of on a broader with a broader brush stroke the guy actually uses footnotes in his book doesn't he or am i thinking of a different Mm. Uh, not that i know of okay i'm thinking Um, of something that's that's uh, that's that's infinite jest that he uses them in it might not be the only the one you're thinking about but it definitely doesn't he might have them in lies Uh, of lock lamora but i've i listened to it so i don't i don't know but um he so he does this amazing thing where it's almost it almost felt like every chapter kind of started with like let me tell you about the world a little bit let me tell you about the city a little bit let me explain this political thing of significance and then you kind of drop into the scene slowly from there and that's more so in the beginning when he is more so constructing the world and building significance towards certain things and he does it less a bit less later in the book you know what it kind of sounds like do, do you know yeah. the trope of like the Twilight Zone, where at the beginning of every episode they would go like, "See Karen, twenty-eight-year-old woman living in New York. Karen has a particular oh, yeah. problem with," and then it yeah. kind of drops yeah. you in, oh. which is really yeah. engaging. So I don't know, given that it, like yeah. authority in the beginning, too. yeah, but it's I don't know, it works. Has a very like, yeah, that that's what came to mind when you described that. It is a bit like that, and it just created this really nice moment where like. The scenes got me hooked in the characters and in the people we're actively with. And because I was then hooked in the characters, I was on board for the world building and these larger scene setting pieces. Because I was like, well, I'm into this story. So now I'm here to hear that. Now I do want to hear your world building and stuff like that. And so it was a nice palate cleanser from like history. And then you have your action, you're close in. And then you have your palate cleanser from that dense close in and you zoom back out a bit and it was a nice up and down. Hmm. That sounds like a perfect example of when showing, uh, telling rather, is actually really effective. Um, what about you, Alex? Mm-hmm. When when do you? When's an example of when you've you've um, told and not shown? 
Yeah. Um, well, yeah, building on what, what Phoenix was saying, um, I, there's there's a, a quote or something where it, the guy says something like, I don't care about the what until I care about the who, right? So the best way to, to introduce us to characters is, is to show them in media res, in action, you know, so we get a sense of who they are. If, if you like, if you immediately tell me someone's whole backstory uh, without knowing anything about them, unless you're a very good writer and there are people who can do it. Um, I'm just going to be bored to tears and I'll just be like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't care about this. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's, it telling is very, uh, is a very powerful way to um, get that backstory information, which is important, which is necessary. Once you have hooked us in with uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, the showing aspect or, or, you know, some, some way to, to connect us to the character. One thing I think about when, when I think about show don't tell is actually some advice, um, something you told me about um, the first book I wrote um, challenger. And I remember you said, I, I really like it. I really like all these scenes, like, and the way it sort of goes through it, but it feels mm -hmm. like they're a little disconnected. And I sort of, I took that away and sat with that uh, advice for a little bit. And I realized it was because I was just giving a lot of scenes that were just show, 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 show. And there was nothing that really linked them together in terms of a telling, in terms of like a greater narrative. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's like it. You, you know what? fits you, into things. Because as you were saying that, I was remembering like, yeah, I, that was the yeah. case, but that's exactly it. There was no like in the yeah. world twenty in the year twenty twenty three. Earth is yeah. Blah 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 blah. That yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah yeah. And I yeah. It, it's it's a shame actually because the first one time when I went uh, through it, I actually did have a little bit of it, and I took it to the writing group, and they were like, "Oh no, you can't do that. Don't do that. Like, don't do any of the <laughs> ah. background stuff." And then I immediately felt like I, I kind of got burnt, and I was like, "Oh well, I'll just I'll just do it." You know. Uh, and when you're done, let, let's talk about. I show don't tell as a truism sorry to interrupt but i really want to touch on this idea that it's it's like this you gotta show don't tell you can't not and that's yeah. sometimes <laughs> you gotta maybe show too... don't tell <laughs> yeah sorry yeah <laughs> please no, please totally. finish um yeah but i i think uh the telling is really important in like uh, I, I always come back to the uh, example of uh, Richard Russo because he is just one of my favorite authors and I think he's one of the best persons, uh, the, the best at doing this. So and what has he written? Like I, he's written, um, my it's a Pulitzer Prize winner, Empire Falls. He also hmm. written uh, no, Nobody's Fool. Actually, also, funnily enough, uh, wrote Straight Man, which is the basis of the, uh, the new um, series, not that new now, it's the series Lucky Hank by the guy who did uh, Breaking Bad. Um, so he wrote oh. that book and then the screenplay was based on that. I haven't seen it, but I am really, really keen to. Hmm. Um, yeah, so he he writes things in very, like, uh, Dickensian, um, uh, like, third person. So, like, there's very clearly, and, and we talked about this a little bit in the um, in the Viewpoint the Perspectives episode, but in this, like, third person, like, I am telling you things with a yep. wink and a nudge, and he can has access to all, all these people, but Yep. he'll he'll work um he'll do a lot of telling in terms of like you know um this this person had got up to this and the reason why they did that was because of this and like back in the day they'd you know been like this and then they they went to this bar and they met this person they were like hey you should do this thing and they're like oh i guess i'll get into plumbing um and so you have these long paragraphs which are very witty and and clever and stuff yeah and he might be one of those people who goes back you know goes back to that thing where he can just tell without like yep. i can't I can't remember if, if any of the books start with that. I think actually, they actually do. And there's just like, hey, I'm just going to tell you how this happened. But it sounds to me like um, the keywords but, there are like witty and and smart. Like it, it's engaging, engaging writing and that's, I'm, I'm assuming yeah. what carries the, the yeah. telling. I mean, I think so. I think so. Maybe it is just a quality of, of writing thing. And I can't really give you any hard examples of why that is so. I think he's just good at it. And yeah. that just comes from experience. But yeah, yeah. that's... That's an example. I feel I feel like a big part of it is just like they're both very they're both both equally valid tools. And in the end, like don't force it. Sometimes yeah. there are moments yeah. where and this this is where an editor can come in handy or a proofreader or a friend, whatever. If there are moments where someone's dropping off, getting bored, something like that, maybe it's an invitation to explore showing, pull them in more. If someone's feeling too bogged down to in the moment it's too dense or whatever maybe it's an opportunity to tell maybe that scene's not necessary and you can just give me a few lines just tell me it happened that's fine um 
I don't know. Like I was just this this book is an anomaly. Blood and Fire by George R. R. Martin. I They're not just props. They're actual. the actual They're, books. They're real Phoenix books. is reaching yes. to the bookshelf behind him, dear listener. <laughs> yes, here it is, far on the left. Um, that book is like all telling, and yeah, it's like it, an encyclopedia, the, and, right, or like a history of. It's like a retelling. It would be like it well. the scrolls of history ri- as written by the the meisters of the time like just recounting the age of the targaryens and how they came to westeros and all this stuff and it's done from a very like eagle's eye point of view because you're essentially looking back on history but he does it in this way where it's like pure telling more or less because obviously he does some tricks where even though it's an eagle's eye view he is showing you stuff even though it's history he does it in a way where you know showing doesn't necessarily mean you're in the moment but i'm guessing he'll um, jump into like scenes of like real historical events where he'll talk about like a famous conversation with a king and the jester and stuff like that right Mm. yes yes and the the thing is is because it's the i guess the real thing is he's showing but because it's done from a historical point of view it's like the details of the feelings and the the moments of combat are skimmed over pretty quickly, but he yeah. still does the build of tension and then the release of tension. And that's what keeps you engaged. But it's art so artfully done. The fact that it's like this style. And when I'm reading it, I am very engaged. It's very impressive. It really sounds like any number of like wikis that are out there. Like I, I mean, you guys are all demi geeks. Like every now and again, you'll find like a book or universe <laughs> or something and go to the wiki for it and just get absolutely absorbed and that's all yeah. just information like it's it's an encyclopedia of mm-hmm. fictional nonsense but it's really yeah. engaging uh to me i think when 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 you're in the market for that like when you know that's what you're going in for and you're after that pure information then yeah t- tell you don't you don't want to be shown you want to be told straight up mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe yeah. it's a case of expectation like, as well that's 100 percent something i could listen to as an audiobook just like doing some work or walking around or whatever you know yeah. just like yeah just tell me all this stuff it's a biography you know like mm. the example i've got is do you guys know the scp foundation yes Mm-mm. uh it's it's absolutely wonderful phoenix i think you should check it out it's an online collective it's not even a collective. It's like people can just write on this website, but they're writing for this fictional universe where there's this organization called the SCP Foundation, which is Secure, Contain, Protect. And they're like a shadowy organization yes. that is keeping at bay all of the bizarre, cosmic, like this would break reality if it got out horrors. So I mean, this is just pulling something out of my ass, but like if everything's written in the form of like kind of a government document, like Code mm, yeah. X1785 redacted class C threat by no means approach this anomaly without proper protective gear, then the list of protective gear. And then it'll be like, oh do not hum. Under no circumstances must anyone hum as they enter this room. Humming will cause the anomaly to become very distressed. Once distressed, the anomaly will. And they tell a story just through this like legalese, like technical speak. And they're kind of showing yeah, because like cool. they never start by telling you what the anomaly is. It's always stuff like that. Like, wait, don't hum. What is this thing? And slowly they'll start to drop the good ones anyway. Cause this is a collective. So there's, you know, some are better than others, mm. but they'll start to drop hints as they go as to what this thing may or may not be. It's all telling, um, but telling in a really artful way. And there are ones that show, and I don't think they're as good when dialogue comes into it. You're like, nah, just, I want the technical details. Give, give me the government yeah. dossier. Yeah. What this is about. Yeah. It's the, yeah, it sounds a lot like um, "Welcome to Night Vale." That or it reminds me of it. It's a Is podcast. A, and I've it's, heard of this. Yeah. My my sister in law listens yeah. to it. It's great. It's, it's um, a podcast where it's just someone giving a news report for a town called Night Vale, and through the news report, the delivery of the news and like some news updates. Um, yeah, there's something weird going on. You kind of piece together what's up. There's a little bit of an arc and stuff like that. But it's not like it's not like breaking news, aliens or blah, 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 blah. It's very like calm and very surreal. And it's like, uh, note to all park walkers today, do not approach the tree behind the school. <laughs> the shadowy figure there does wish to be left alone and should not be yeah. approached under any circumstances. I, this is right in my wheel. That's actually, I really want to listen to this. No. You would probably love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty yeah. fun. It is pretty fun. I, I guess that there is always a time for telling. Telling is important. Um, oh, and the example I was going to have for more conviction, conventional fiction, I mean, this is all stuff we're talking about now that's specifically designed as a telling medium, but um, sometimes you just want to tell us that the character traveled 
Like you just want to tell us that they got in the car and drove. You don't need to show them getting the keys, opening the door, yeah. turning on the radio. Sometimes it's not important. Telling can be a really good way of just mm-hmm. saving time. Um, I'm thinking to Fight Club. I haven't read the book, but in the film, do you remember toward the end, um, Edward Norton's character is like kind of flying around America looking at all these different fight clubs that have been set up by quote unquote Tyler Durden. And he's just telling us, he doesn't bother to show us the details of everyone. It's just like going to narration mode, like quickly, like New York, Seattle, Chicago, these things are everywhere. They were set up more than I could have imagined. How could he possibly have done this in such a short time? And it's just, it's simply a time-saving measure, but it's, it's, it works really well though. Yeah. To me, that just, that brings me back to like, don't force it i found myself in moments where i'm like oh i gotta get to this one scene but i've had moments like that where i'm like but first i gotta i just gotta get them into their car and then i gotta drive them there it feels like this very mundane like oh what am i doing and in those moments you can just say just in one line give some colorful descriptor of them getting to the place like if it's not if you if you know where your next point of juiciness is and that's where you need to go just like get yourself there and all you need to do is make sure the reader goes there with you and then like bring in that levity just shoot them there get to the important part because that's that's what your story's there for is the important part the context that is going to deliver the story to your reader what's that quote about writing being life without the boring bits uh who's that i oh yeah that's that's um uh yes he's the guy who like jackie brown is based on his book oh what's his name huh. i love that guy uh i can't remember it I can't point remember, is yeah sometimes yeah, no. it's just it's just a anyway. good way of like getting rid of the chaff yeah it's it's basically like when you when you're telling like you can just you can just jump around to the bits that are important and let the story dictate when when you go to those different parts like there are different speed okay to use a really clunky metaphor it's like it's like uh when you're driving a car if anyone's driven a manual car before when you start off you're in first gear and that's like really high revs and it's very and that it's very like it would be very close to like action like showing right and as you get onto the highway you switch onto another gear and that's third gear and that or, or fifth gear and then like it's it's kind of uh, further out it's zoomed out a little bit more the, the the um the car is moving faster there's not as much you know like high revs and things this is a really really terrible analogy but basically you're switching between different gears different modes you know um and you want to let the story dictate when you do each of those modes don't, don't try and force something just because i mean it's easy to fall into the the mode of just doing what you know how to do and that's certainly what I've done a lot of times. I just do the things that I know how to do. But yeah, sometimes you need to lean out and, um, you know, each of those ways of doing it have different idioms. You know, some are a little more flowery or some are a little more formal uh, or some of the very just like bullet point by bullet point. But it's important to recognize the cadence of what you're writing and yeah. follow that where it mm-hmm. goes. Totally. Telling and showing are both different tools in the toolbox, right? Yeah, they're tools. Yeah. Don't be a man. You and Matan, you and Matan independently arrived at the same analogy. He like he'd also described it as shifting gears in a car. And honestly, like that was that was helpful for me when he said it. I'm like, oh, they are different speeds. That is what they're doing. Yeah. He probably just <laughs> described it better. For those who has um, never driven a manual, yeah, we completely no, they, like blank out. But that's okay. Yeah. Our no, Philistines. Yeah, if you haven't driven a manual, you're not gonna know. Yeah, we, we can um, guess. but to, to what I just said. Don't be a man with a hammer. The, to, to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a, a nail. And the, the hammer is not the only tool. You know, you've got to mm. you look in your toolbox and see, oh, well, actually, this is a screw. Maybe I'll just screw it in gently instead of pounding it into the wall. You know? Yeah, I, I think that works. I think that works. I want to give, and I, we're coming close to the end here, but I've got a beautiful example of... Um, uh, the American author, Charles Frazier, I actually am not very familiar with his stuff, but he's got a novel called Cold Mountain, which I actually really want to read now. And he's got a beautiful description of a, well, I won't even tell you. He doesn't tell you. He just shows. Um, the hayfield beyond the beaten dot of the school playground stood pant waist high and the heads of grass were turning yellow from need of cutting. The teacher was a round little old man, hairless and pink of face. He owned but one rusty black suit of clothes and a pair of old, over-large dress boots that curled up at the toes and were so worn down that the heels were wedge-like. He stood at the front of the room, rocking back and forth on the points. 
absolutely love that. You know, I can imagine, I, I understand so much about that town without him telling mm-hmm. me a single thing. It's almost like showing, it's like almost like showing is, it's almost like indirect telling. Tell me about the thing adjacent and then I'll create the thing next to it. Yeah, he's showing us the yeah, moonlight. Yeah. Tell, he's showing us the glint. Mm-hmm. Tell me the things, tell me the things that I can put together to form a gestalt of this scene. Mm. Mm-hmm. Phoenix, do you want to wrap us up with a quote? I'd love to do that. So our good friend Jeff Somers once said, the problem with show don't tell isn't that it's inherently bad advice. It's that people understand it to mean you can never tell the reader anything. And that's simply not true. Very wise. Very wise advice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, that does it for Show Don't Tell. Um, Listeners, if you've enjoyed this, if you've got something out of it, please consider rating and reviewing. We'd love a five-star review, but review it honestly. Give us feedback if you want. Anything at all helps, and it particularly helps the algorithm. It's the only way we can really get seen. Also, if you're interested in what we do, um, we three are part of a collective of six people called Precipice Fiction. We have an anthology of science fiction, horror, and sci-fi. It is called The New Mythic. It is out now on Amazon, and it is it contains two Aurealis nominated writers. So how's that for authority? Uh, and an Aurealis yeah. judge, apparently. <laughs> well, and not an of that one, judge. And an No, Aurealis not of that judge. one. <laughs> well, this has been great. Thanks, guys. We're Precipice Fiction. Uh, join us again next week for more talking about writing, and uh, we'll see you then. Yeah. See you. See you, folks. Bye-bye. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction Podcast.